Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. You may be seated. The theme of the book of James is, what is the marks of a real Christian? What does a real Christian look like? James has given us a lot of evidence and things that we need to think about as it pertains to this conversation. And it's really caused a lot of us to step back and evaluate, or it should cause us to step back and evaluate our lives and honestly answer the question, am I a believer? Uh, Not have I grown up in church, not what was the faith of my grandfather and grandmother, my father and mother, is am I a Christian? Have I made this Uh, this walk of faith my own. And then the other question is, is if it's true that we've been truly born again and that we've been converted by uh, Jesus Christ, then we have to ask the question, do I live like a Christian? And so James is painting a picture in the entire book of what a real Christian actually looks like. We've had individuals uh, during this series that have discovered amongst us that they thought they were Christians and they really weren't. And God revealed that to them and brought them to a place of conviction and brought, granted them the gift of repentance and God saved people amongst us through this series just out of discovering this. So we are almost done with this powerful book. We'll wrap up chapter four. We've got one more chapter to go. Uh, so don't waste another opportunity to look carefully what the Holy Spirit is revealing about the true nature of what Christianity looks like as it's manifested in someone's life. So to add to our already existing list of things that genuine Christians do, we must consider that genuine Christians desire to do and follow God's will. David, a man after God's own heart, said this. He says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. He also said in Psalm 143.10, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Now, how important is this issue? This is how important this issue is. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's how paramount of importance this topic really is. Now, does this mean that us doing the will of God is what saves us? No. Doing the will of God means that we're obedient to what God has asked of us. We're obedient to the scriptures. We're obedient to the follow, following of the Spirit's guidance in our life. But that obedience in itself does not save us. We are saved by grace uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. But when you, your faith is genuine, it manifests itself in obedience, which means you have a desire to follow God's will for your life. Jesus was our greatest example of this, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So even Jesus, who is God, said, I'm submitting myself to the will of the Father to show you that this is how it's done. Now, why would it then, on the flip side of this, why would it become an, an issue that we would not obey, that we would not follow, that we would not walk in God's will? Why would that become of paramount importance? Because a person that doesn't follow God's will, doesn't want to follow, doesn't consider God in, in what they do, they have an issue of pride. And, and just for the record, that's all of us. So while you're thinking of Uh, somebody that needs to hear this sermon, uh, it's probably you first, okay? And as I'm writing this sermon, uh, it it was me first, okay? Only those that refuse to submit to God's will show that the reality is, is they have reserved the spot as the role of the sovereign Lord of their life to themselves. They still want to be in control. They want to say, I want to go where I want to go. I want to do what I want to do. I want to go about things the way I want to go about things for my own personal prerogatives and reasons. This person is still their own God. 
Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The truth is, is that Christians don't live their own lives anymore. That reality may or may not have been clear when the preacher presented the gospel to you and you received it by faith. It may have not have been crystal clear that what you were actually signing up for was death. The only, the only response to a person being born again is that they lay down their lives as a sacrifice to God. They live for the Lord's purposes and will rather than their own. But there is, sadly, a lot of people that would rather assume the benefits of salvation. They want a ticket out of a burning building. But they would rather go on living the way they want to live. The problem is, there isn't, this isn't the heart of a truly saved person. Because a truly converted person that's born again doesn't desire to cling to their own life anymore. They see their life as something that is a worthy sacrifice to give away for the king. That doesn't mean we won't screw up and we won't become selfish from time to time. But in general, a born-again believer seeks to please God more than live their own life. Matthew 10, 39, whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. <coughs> a born-again person understands that living your life your own way is not only living living life your own way is disaster, but giving up your life to live the way God wants you to, to follow His will, to follow His plan. It's not just a worthy offering of worship to God, but it actually ends up being incredibly desirable for the individual. Because when you give your life away to the Lord and live for him rather than for yourself, you find true joy, true peace, and true fulfillment in that. And isn't that what we're really going for in this life? Isn't that the reason why we strive and we work so hard and we, we do all the, the, the stupid things that we do sometimes is because we want those things, joy, fulfillment, peace? But the answer in it is not to cling on to your life, it's to give it away. Don't we all just want to live outside of, live away from chaos? How many of you, you know what chaos is like? And you'd rather have peace. You'd rather have inner contentment. How many of you would love to not be in a place where you're always having to strive to have what someone else has or to be what someone else is? And you just like that contentment. How many of you would like personal fulfillment, feeling like you have a purpose and that purpose serves a higher cause than just working for the man and paying taxes and dying. Well, all of that is found in giving your life away to Jesus Christ. The answer is in giving one's life away rather than clinging onto it for dear life. So let's look at our text today and cover this important topic, verse 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Now, you type A's in the room. You know the, the rest of the verse. We, we read it, how it was evil to do such a thing. You type A's in the room, immediately cringe at this statement. How many type A's we got in the room? Raise your hand. It's all right. Uh, lift them up. Come on, be more proud of your status as a type A. Come on. I have to calculate how far my hand goes up. You type A's are looking at this. Today or tomorrow, we're going to such a place. What are you telling me this is wrong? Can I not map out my day? It's today and tomorrow for crying out loud. Who doesn't map out their tomorrow? How are you supposed to know what to do if you don't have a calendar to look up whenever you get outside or when you go to bed at night? How are you going to know? what? This is just chaos if you can't plan anything. Are you telling me that today or tomorrow I can't plan to go to such and such town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit? What are you telling me that I can't make this plan? You're telling me this is evil. Is this saying that I have to live in such imminent fear that any moment my life could end, therefore I can't plan anything? Is that what this is saying? I mean, this sounds like a dream for you type Bs. <laughs> Unite. Woo! I don't have to look at another calendar. God says it's evil. 
You type A's, you keep your calendars to yourself. I'm going to get up when I want to get up. I'm going to do what I want to do. Hey, I'm still going to get the job done, but it's just going to be random and at my own leisure and time. So this sounds like a dream for type A's. It sounds like a nightmare for you type A's. What about you business people? Does this mean that you can't travel, make travel plans and arrangements? You can't spend certain times in certain areas and regions in the country to make money? Wouldn't that alone make a lot of jobs that are available in America today sinful if we couldn't do such a thing? No, that's not what this is saying. <coughs> this, this illustration would have been familiar to James's readers. Remember James 1.1? 1, 1, he's writing to the dispersed Jews. These Jews that over a period of, of five centuries have, been, have left their homeland for whatever reason, most of them negative, and they are spread out. They don't have the homeland to give them jobs and do all those sort of things. So they had to do what they had to do to make ends meet and get by. And so they moved to where the money was. They had to. They had to constantly be going about moving to different locations. Not everyone would hire them because they're surrounded by Gentiles. So the Gentiles, they would not hire them. They would find, if this, this person over here would hire Gentiles, they would go over here and work for this group, and then they would go over here and work for this group. They'd get tired of them. These Gentiles would be persecuted because they're hiring Jews, so then they would stop, and then they have to go over here. It was very complicated. They, they, couldn't, they were transients, essentially moving from place to place just to get enough money to survive, shelter, eat, that sort of thing. They didn't have the protection of the homeland, and the Gentiles hated the Israelites and so on and so forth. So they moved where the money was. It's sort of like a food truck. Trusters Tacos. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to park downtown square. Not, not really. I don't have a taco truck. That would be cool, though. Ministry retirement goals, I guess. But like today, I'm going to park at downtown square. But tomorrow, I'm not going to go back to, down, to downtown square. Why? Because the 200 people that work in the office building at downtown square had tacos yesterday. They had Trester's tacos yesterday. So they're probably not going to want Trester's tacos. They're probably going to want Qdoba or something like that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my truck. I'm going to go down to the convention center where there's an event. There's 2,000 people. Those people will probably want tacos because they're going to get hungry in the middle of the day. I'm going to get my permit. I'm going to plug in. I'm going to sell my tacos. But then, but then on Monday, that, that, that event's over. But then there's a regional tournament. There's a regional basketball tournament over here, and everybody knows that tacos is what gets you through a regional basketball tournament. So I'm going to park my taco truck, get a permit, plug in, I'm going to plug in, and there's 8,000 people this tournament. I'm going to plug in, and then people are going to want tacos in between their basketball games. That's how it works, right? Savvy businessmen go, or people, go where the money goes. Sometimes you have to move around. Is that somehow evil? No. Not at all. That's not what this is saying. In fact, sometimes you have to do those sort of things to make a buck, to keep your family alive. What this is condemning is not that being mindful of your schedule and your business ventures is evil. It means don't make your plans without any consideration for what God wants. Amen. The person that James is speaking about made plans, which was not the problem. The problem was they ignored God as a part of the plans. Or more importantly, they didn't consider that God was actually sovereign over their plans. The problem was also in this, they showed a disregard for the reality that sometimes we get caught up in the hustle of making money and, and taking care of our family and making plans that we forget that's not what life is really about. Sometimes we get caught up on this, and, and sometimes it takes, unfortunately, a tragedy, someone getting sick or ill or a funeral, to make us stop and pause for a second and realize the things that really are important in life, each other, not our business pursuits. There's nothing wrong with business pursuits, but we get so caught up in it, and we, and we get wrapped up into it to where we begin getting narrow-sighted, and we lose focus on the things that matter most. And the thing that matters most is our relationship with God, and then our family follows that. Sometimes we get caught up in the plans of where we'd like to be in a few years. And rather than seeing and anticipating the work that God is doing right in front of our lives right now. The truth is, is most of us won't be able to do what God's asking us to do in five years unless we stop and learn what he's teaching us to do right now. And, and it may be the case for some of us that we won't get to that place because God won't turn that loose 
because we haven't yet slowed down enough to learn what he's teaching us in the moment. So this, the problem in this sort of planning is it turns the person into their own God. They make their plans. They do what they want. They set the tone for their life. <coughs> so what I want to do is I want to I tear apart verse 13 and then use the rest of the verses to reinforce it. But I want to talk about five things that a person plans without God. And verse 13 lays that out for us. So five things that a person plans without God. The first one is how to spend time. And we see this in today or tomorrow we will go. Time is the most precious of all commodities. For those of us, like as you run out of time in your life, you realize that. You can spend all of your money, you can lose all of your money, and you can still rebuild wealth. You can still work hard. It's not easy, but you can still work hard, rebuild wealth. Money is replaceable. You can lose your house. There are ways to work and, and get another one. You can lose your job. You can apply for another one. These are not small things, but they are commodities that can be replenished. Time, you can't get that back. I'm waiting on Marty McFly to drop in and solve that problem, but it's not happening. Unless you're a government conspiracy and it's already happened. So time, you can't get that back. This is something I've been thinking about a lot recently. Maybe call it a delayed midlife crisis. I'm pretty happy with what the Lord has done in my life so far. But I can't help to think about some things that I, I didn't capitalize on. I can't help but wonder what certain experiences might have been like if I had made the decision, and this is my problem, to play instead of work. That's always been my problem is to work too much, and then not play enough. And I always wondered, like, what would it have been like to experience? My daughter is a high school athlete, and sometimes I wonder what I missed out on by not having that camaraderie and that, that athleticism because I felt like I had to work all the time, even as, even as a young man. And so I look back and I look at some of those things and, and reevaluate. It's, it's, it's the small choices that we make incrementally every day that lead to life-altering situations and circumstances that we're faced with today. But even then, life can come along and bam, and it's all changed in an instant. Someone gets sick, someone gets hurt, someone passes away. And it doesn't have to all be bad. I, you can win the lottery, if that's your thing. Get promoted, get an internship in another country. Fall in love. How many of us, our life completely, drastically changed when we fell in love? While we can't control those things, we can control how we spend our time. Two things about our lives will always show us what we really love, how we spend our time and how we spend our money. You show me someone's calendar and you show me someone's bank account and I'll tell you what they love. Amen. The question that James is presenting here is, is God in your schedule? Have you made time? Have you considered him how you go about your day, your calendar, and the things you do? Do you spend time with him? Church is great. Uh, it's, a, it's a great forum for us to gather together. Church is great. But I'm, I'm not just talking about this. I'm talking about you and him. I'm talking about pray, prayer, reading scripture, journaling. <coughs> is there a consideration for time with God in the midst of all of your busyness? The second thing that a person plans without God, where to go? We see this into such and such a town. People that don't serve the Lord live wherever they want and go wherever they want because they're their own God. They don't answer to really anybody but themselves. But people that serve the Lord live where God wants them to live. Every place I've ever lived in my life, had some sort of ministry assignment. That's what God's called me to. I'm not saying that that's okay. All of us are called the ministry. But everywhere I've lived have had a ministry assignment. Parsons, Kansas. Humboldt, Kansas. Back to Parsons, Kansas. Webb City, Missouri. Springfield, Missouri. Republic, Missouri. Every town I've lived in had a ministry assignment. Some of which I didn't know what that assignment was until I got there. Okay? I'd be willing to bet that's been true for you as well. Every place that you've ever lived, every place that life has taken you, there was some sort of assignment. 
And, and as long as you've been a Christian, it was ministry related. It was gospel related. I even look where I live currently and I look at my neighbors that live next to me and I think this is not a coincidence. But it's more than that. It's more than just choosing a location by which where you live. It's about everywhere you go. And this isn't just saying, well, don't go to the bad places that are full of sin, though that's part of it. But it's about listening to the Lord and having him guide your steps on where you navigate your feet and where you turn your wills. <laughs> a Christian chooses what school they go to, what place they work, what church they attend, what bit, where they do business, where they fellowship, based on the will of God. God, what do you want? Now, don't hyper-spiritualize this on me. I don't mean to turn everybody into something where you get in the car and you're so paranoid about following the will of God that you're sitting in the car shaking and you're like, God, I don't even know where to drive anymore because I don't know your will. That's not what this is meant to generate. This is meant to generate that when you get in your car, pray and say, God, would you work out my day the way you want to? And then just get in the car and drive off in peace, knowing that God's going to work all things to the good for those who are called according to your, his purpose. You don't have to worry about it. The Bible says man makes his plans, but God orders his steps. So you don't need to get in your car and freak out over every part of your day and every decision you're going to make and worry if you're going to displease God. All you got to do is submit yourself to God, and he will bring about his plan in your life. It's as simple as that. When we put it all on ourselves, we take away from God's sovereignty. We take away from the fact that God is working even in our midst when we don't realize he's there. That he can bring about his plan even when we're, not, we're just being goofballs and not paying attention. God's bigger than that. And we're not in control. So all you have to do is submit yourself to him and say, God, whatever you want, I'm good with it today. And when the Holy Spirit comes along and prompts you, walk down the vegetable aisle. Do it. You never know who's there. Sometimes it's not even that. Sometimes you're walking down the vegetable aisle because you need vegetables. And all of a sudden, bow! There's somebody there that needs to talk to you. And you have that divine encounter. You have that divine conversation. What I'm saying is, before you go about your days, go about your months, go about your years, are you where God wants you to be? Have you submitted to his plans or do you just make plans and say, I don't care what God thinks? Because when you're out of place because you haven't submitted to him, you're miserable. God tends to make people miserable when they are not being obedient. I've been there. It Stinks. That's what we call a lack of peace. I don't hear a ton of amens, but I know by the looks on your faces that I'm not the only one that's done stupid stuff that was disobedient and, been, and lived sometimes a lot longer than what I want to admit in, in an absence of peace. Okay? So are you being wise with where you do business? Are you being wise with where you set your footprint? Are you being wise with what you watch, where you go, how you spend? Have you considered God in all these things? When you arrive to the locations that you arrive, do you represent the Lord well? Do you think about what his will might be that you're in this place right now? Yes, even the trip to Walmart that Man, it doesn't feel like anything about going to Walmart is holy. But God can, God can redeem. Genesis 50, 20, what devil meant for harm, God can use for good. So even in your trip to Walmart, when there's a bunch of crazy people around, you can't get your cart through a single stinking aisle. Stop and consider, does God have me here for a reason? Is, is there somebody I want to come across? Is there there's a reason? Is it or or maybe today we're not? It's not any of that. It's just I'm just getting food for my kids because God's asked me to take care of my kids. Maybe it's just that. Don't turn it into you you anxiety ridden people. Don't turn this into an anxiety thing. Just trust God. Amen. If He wants to bring somebody in your path, the phone's going to ring. 
the email is going to pop up, the text message is going to come, or you're going to walk into them in, in the, at the mall or at Walmart. It's going to happen. You're just going to come across them, all right? If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. You don't have to worry about nothing. You just submit to God and go about your day and just chill. Now, if you get in your car in the morning and you're like, oh, i got to be at work at 9 a.m., it's 8.45, I'm not sure if it's God's will for me to go to work today. It's God's will for you to go to work. <laughs> put, your, put your keys in the ignition, put the shifter in gear, and go to work. Like, this is not one of those things where you're going to use this to get out of stuff, okay? I want to make this clear. Maybe your kid's soccer team is annoying because it takes up two evenings of your week, and your child just picks flowers on the field. But what about that parent that comes and sits down next to you during the game that doesn't know Christ or is disconnected from church because of a bad experience or just simply needs a friend? What about the grumpy cashier or delivery driver assigned to your neighborhood? Is that all just by accident? Or did God appoint them to cross your path? I don't know. That's between you and him to decide. Here's the deal. I'm not saying that there's a super divine reason behind every interaction, but if we aren't at least paying, praying about it and paying attention and considering it, we will miss opportunities. And the cool thing about God is that even when we miss opportunities, he'll make another one. So there's grace and there's forgiveness and he knows that there's a reason why he calls us sheep. We're stubborn and, and we're hard to deal with sometimes. He knows that. He's not surprised by any of that. And he, he brings around second chances. So this is what James is saying. Consider God when you decide where to go. Also, consider God for how long you stay. Spend a year there. <coughs> how many times have you been in situations where you just wanted to leave but you got caught by someone on the way out the door that wanted to talk to you. Introverts unite. Where you were just peopled out and you were done. Uh, I said in a sermon a few weeks ago, you can tell, like, especially on Sunday mornings, because I'm an introvert uh, uh, or an omnivert or whatever. And, and by the way, that doesn't mean you're shy. It just means you recharge away from people. Like you get your strength away from people where extroverts get their strength with people. That's my wife. I'm an introvert. I get my strength away from people. I, I just, uh, I love you all dearly. I just have to have a break. And so uh, I, have to, I have to step away to recharge my battery. And so I will tell people, and it's funny, you all bring it up now every time you see it, but there, there, there is a certain point on Sunday afternoon about 12, 30, 1 o'clock where I am done, I'm peopled out, and you will see it come washing across my face. <laughs> and I will usually go off in the corner and set somewhere away from the conversation, and wait for everybody to get done so we can go eat or whatever. But you will can tell when it comes across my face, I'm done. I'm done with people today. So what I'm saying is sometimes you're going to run into situations where you just want to get out, you just want to leave. I want to get in the car. I want to go home. I want to close my eyes. I want to lay down. But God has other plans. Are you willing to do that? Because that one conversation could change their life. And you know what? To be honest with you, it could change yours too. And, and what I've noticed, just by personal experience, I can't back this biblically, just by personal experience in my own life, I've noticed it's those times that end up being the most critical. Because God catches me when I'm weak, and then he's strong in my weakness. It happens. So your duration of stay, how long you stay places, are you allowing God? Are you submitting to God in those things? Uh, I remember a story. Paul Washer is one of my favorite communicators, great guy and pastor. He, um, he talked about a situation once where he went and he preached a gospel message, and he travels around and speaks at different places a lot. <coughs> and he went to a place, and he preached, and he always preaches the gospel really well. And uh, a, a gentleman got uh, converted. He got saved in, in the meeting, and, and, uh, and he walked up to Paul, and he started talking to him. And this gentleman was only going to be in the area for three weeks, and then he had to move on. And, and, and he felt, Paul felt compelled as he was talking to this young man who just got saved that he was to cancel all of his appointments. He had appointments preaching. He had flights. He had hotel arrangements. 
All of these things that he had to do over the next three weeks. And he felt compelled that the Spirit of God was asking him to cancel all of that and to just stay with this man and to live with him for the next three weeks and teach him everything about Christ and the Bible that he knows. And he did. And I'm sure he lost a lot of money. I'm sure he lost a lot of, I'm sure that, that there was hard conversations with these churches that were expecting him to fly in and preach at these conferences and these events. And he said, you would think going and preaching at a conference would be God's will. But God said, no, you go spend time with this man for the next three weeks. You teach him everything he needs to know about me. Everything that you've learned, you teach him in those three weeks. You live with him. You do life with him for the next three weeks. And you'll never see him again. And he followed the will of God. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to cancel plans and call things off at the, at the whim of a call of God to say, stop? The most important thing right now is not for you to fly and preach at a conference with 5,000 people. The most important thing is for you to sit with that new convert for the next three weeks and teach them everything you know. Are you willing to do that? I look at myself and I say, am I willing to do that? How long are you going to stay? Second is what activities they do and trade, okay? There's nothing wrong with business. There's nothing wrong with play. There's nothing wrong with leisure. There's nothing wrong with entertainment. But have we considered God's will and desire in each of these things? Because without it, without him, work will turn into an idol. Play may turn into sin. Leisure may turn into sloth, and entertainment may corrupt. But when you put God in the midst of those things, then it becomes God-honoring rather than something that is sinful. And lastly, we choose goals and make a profit. <laughs> There's a <coughs> massive movement in Christianity today to encourage people to chase after their, uh, insert buzzword, destiny, purpose. That God has a big plan for your life and that he's put something really special on the inside of you and it just needs to be realized in your potential and all the hard things in your life is because you're the David and you're amazing and you're going to overcome the Goliath and that God wants to use you in amazing ways that you could never imagine. Now, all of that is actually, not the part about you being David, but all of that is actually true. He does have a big plan for your life. He does. He has put something really special on the inside of you. It's called the Holy Spirit. And, and, and he does want to use you in ways that you could never even begin to imagine. But I guarantee you it will not look like you think it's going to look. God had a great plan for the Apostle Paul. He got his head taken off. God had a great plan for the Apostle Peter. He, he was crucified upside down. God had a great plan for William Tyndale to translate the Bible to the English language for the to be the first one to do that. He was burned at the stake for false accusations of heresy from the Roman Catholic Church who wanted to maintain the power and control of interpreting the Bible for the people from Latin. They didn't want the people reading the Bible for themselves. So they took William Tyndale and said he's a heretic and they burned him at the stake. Now, this doesn't mean that everyone dies like that. It doesn't mean that everyone dies brutal deaths. It could, but sometimes we are so selfish that we believe that the dreams and destinies that God has planned only brings health, wealth, prosperity, fame, significance, book sales, movie sales, and standing in front of large audiences. We have to redefine success. One of the... <coughs> core issues in the church today is the idolatry, the sin of uh, significance. Everyone wants to be significant. And, but, but the problem with that, and, and, and trust me, hear me out, everyone that does the work of the gospel is significant. But they're significant because, because of the glory of God, not because of anything they did. We didn't even save ourselves. How could we be significant? God does it all, but it's significant work that we do. But, it, but at the end of the day, God determines what is significant. And if that means canceling all your plans to spend three weeks with a new convert, that's what God considers significant. There are no-name missionaries in the middle of a forest somewhere eating things that, 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 we, that we kill for game that are being persecuted and possibly even killed for the gospel that will be more heralded in the court of heavens than some of the biggest names you see on TV for Christianity today. And nobody knows their name, but God does. 
And God sees what we can't see. One of our biggest idols in the church is significance. Everyone wants their work for the gospel to be significant, and they get to determine what significance is. Movie sells, book sells, CD sells. See, kids, CD, compact disc. It's a little spinny thing that when it's scratched, it skipped in the car, and when you had a bad CD player in the car, it skipped a lot. We don't get to tell God what the end result of our obedience will look like. Sometimes, most of the time, it won't look anything like we thought, and that's okay. If God told you everything that you would endure in this life, I mean, just think, for some of you who have who've lived a little bit longer, if God told you everything that you have had to endure back when you were younger, what would have that done to you? It would have crushed you. You wouldn't have been able to handle it. But because you matured in Christ, because you got tougher and you got endurance through trials, you were able to take on some things throughout your life. And now you have that wisdom that you can impart to younger people. That's how life works. But it didn't look like you thought it was going to look like, right? The Bible is chock full of warnings that we will be persecuted for living a godly life. That there will be opposition. The gospel will divide families. It will cause tribulation. And for us to act like all of that just applies to some third world country and we get to run around selling t-shirts with our own names on them like we're a superhero for Jesus, getting rich and building our own empires off of his name, shame on us. That's never what this was meant to look like. Every Christian has the same goal. It's not to make a profit. You have to make money to feed your family, but it's to glorify Jesus. It's to glorify God in Jesus Christ. That's every Christian's goal, and that's what you do when you serve him and you follow him in his will. Now, here's what I also want us to see. Life is short. (coughs) Verse 14, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and boom vanishes. Those of you who have lived a little bit longer, you understand this, right? Man, it goes quick. Charles Spurgeon says, time is short, eternity is long. It is only reasonable that this short life be lived in the light of eternity. And this leads me to my final call, and that is the sin of presumption. It is a sin to presume, and verses 15 through 17 show us that, it is a sin to presume that tomorrow is even going to be there. It's even as much of a sin to presume that God doesn't care about how you live your life today. He gave you today, and that is a gift You don't realize how wonderful it is to breathe in clean air until you can't breathe. You don't realize how amazing a warm meal tastes until you don't have anything to eat. You don't realize how amazing it is. I'm giving a little self props here. You don't, you don't realize how amazing it is to have a healthy church to be a part of until they try to shut them down or you can't find one. You don't realize how awesome it is to get in your car and go places without much effort until the gas is $5 or more a gallon and you can't afford it. You don't realize the value of friendship until you lose one. You don't understand how great it is to go for a walk until your legs don't work. You don't understand what a gift your job is until you get fired or laid off. And you don't understand how amazing your family is until they're gone. Don't presume it's all going to be there tomorrow. And don't live today as if God doesn't exist. That's what James is telling us. 
Don't live today as if God doesn't exist because he gave you today. And, and you don't have permission to take your next breath unless he grants it. That's how sovereign he is. This life is a gift, a window of time to repent of our sins and turn to him. And for those who do that, he keeps us here. Why? Because there's other people that he wants to save. And he wants to use us as instruments of proclamation of the gospel to them. That's why we exist and that's why we breathe. That's why we get up every day. Yeah, you have families, you have jobs. These are all part of our normal everyday activities. And it's all gospel as long as we're honoring God in those things. It's all gospel elevating because it's, this, it's the structure by which he's asked us to live. The family, the procreation, the, the whole plan that he has for us and, and to work the ground, which is part of the curse. He's asked us to do these things with our lives. Those things are not insignificant. Those things are very significant. In fact, for a person who disregards all those things, to go and do significant things is, doing, is dishonoring God. So we have to do our day-to-day things. We have to go to the grocery store, and we have to take care of our children, and we have, to, we have to live out our lives, and we have to love our spouses and do all those things well. But don't go about your day-to-day without considering God. And, and James says it's evil to do so. Because if you don't consider God, then you are God. But consider that. And don't be presumptuous that tomorrow will be there. There's going to be, uh, there's going to be a day when tomorrow is not going to be there for all of us. Whether it's our life or Jesus returns, whatever it is, there's going to be a time where it's going to be our last day. And we're not, most of the time, we're not going to have the benefit of knowing when that is. So live every day in consideration of God. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you.